Well, welcome everyone and thank you for attending Accounting Evolution from Pain to Power. So during today's uh, presentation, this will talk about the evolution of how accountants or bookkeepers have moved from a back office function to a strategic opportunity and function and how they can leverage their power to influence and also assist small businesses all the way up to large corporations. This webinar is co-hosted by Neotax as well as Mercury. Please note these materials are for educational purposes only and should not be used as tax or financial advice. So some housekeeping items before we get started. One, again, thank you for attending the virtual event. We'll be recording the event and at the end, we'll provide everyone with the recording as well as some other additional resources. If you have any questions, please post them in the comments or Q&A section and we'll try to get through them at the end of the presentation. Again, we're really excited for you to be here and hope you learn a lot. So with that being said, uh, we'll start with introductions. Uh, Ibrahim. Hi, I'm Ibrahim. I'm the founder and CEO at Neotax. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Taylor. I run business development at Neotax, uh, as well as spent a number of years in the accounting industry working at KPMG and other uh, accounting uh, service firms. I am Jason. I'm VP of Capital Mercury. Um, I help oversee our, our partners to, to give funding options uh, to companies. And, and one of those partners is Neotax. So we work closely with Ibrahim and Taylor. Um, background, I've worked in the big four investment banking, and then I've been a, a CFO a couple of times. And hi, everyone. I'm Alex. I work on the uh, strategic partnerships team uh, at Mercury. So I work with... Um, our accounting partners to both ensure their clients are onboarded smoothly and that partners are leveraging Mercury's capabilities to, to give the best value to their clients. Um, don't have an accounting background myself. My history is more in payment infrastructure disruption, working at, at, at Stripe and Square before that. Um, certainly see parallels working for Mercury as it pertains to you know a tech company focusing on financial in infrastructure and the benefits that can provide to, to partners and uh, customers. Awesome. Well, again, as we have a star-studded group, so should be able to answer any questions that you do have as we go throughout the presentation. So a, a, a quick background. So accounts have historically been relied upon to ensure the numbers are accurate so that an organization can understand its financial position and meet its financial obligations. But that role has changed and it continues to change rapidly. The combination of a fast evolving regulatory landscape, emerging business trend and relentless technological innovation is changing the way financial data is collected, managed and interpreted. The COVID-19 pandemic spurred many of these changes resulting in new regulatory tax returns, forcing dispersed accounting teams to find new ways to collaborate and pushing more organizations to consider cloud-based technologies that have helped them conduct business as usual from home. Together, these forces are bringing a shift to the role of an accountant. The manual transactional work that an accountant has typically done is increasingly automated, and accountants are asked to be paired with these financial experts with soft skills such as leadership, as well as the skills needed to extract data and analysis. There's two companies that are assisting this evolution change and in empowering the accountants. Those are both Neotax and Mercury. So today, today we're going to explain where we're going to walk through a couple of things. One, we're going to walk through the transition from compliance to advisory. We're going to talk about the accounting tech evolution. And then additionally, we're going to talk for our predictions for the accounting industry of 2022 and beyond. And then we're going to also allocate time uh, for questions at the end. So jumping into things, we wanted to give a quick background around why is this change occurring? I talked about a lot of other items that were occurring before uh, the previous slide, but what are some things that we started to realize? So one of the barometers that we started to look at or one of the areas that we started to kind of pinpoint was what is the evolution that the big four or the larger accounting firms are following? So just a quick background, and as everyone's aware, so in the early 2000s, there was a dot-com bubble burst. A lot of people are even saying that's looking a lot like today's environment. So then all the, and then in 2002, uh, there was uh, Serbians and Oxley was passed for financial oversight due to the Enron uh, fiasco. Well, what that automatically uh, created, especially on the big four, was a gold rush 
to work on obtaining uh, or setting up the infrastructure for audit and around more, again, that, that compliance type work. So for a really long time from 2002, I probably all the way say up to 2010, 2012, a lot of these big four accounting firms and even general accounting firms were primarily building teams around uh, compliance, which was primary, or a lot of it was driven by SOX. Um, as an individual who was working at KPMG during those times, and also in the audit perspective, I did see that experience. I saw the size of the uh, audit firms or the uh, number of employees on the audit side were exponentially higher than any other services firms. However, all of a sudden, in early 2010, there started to become a switch. And that switch started it, it, within the big four, started to primarily focus now that th these individuals have a lot of insights, relationships with these organizations, what are other services that they can provide now it, to uh, not only uh, assist on the way that they continue to provide uh, educational or also strategic opportunities, and then all of a sudden, this word advisory started to come up. So from uh, in my personal perspective, around post-2010, probably up in 2015, there was a financial, there was a, a dramatic switch within the business for the individuals from an employee level. All of a sudden, an audit started and this advisory practice or advisory service or had 95 different names when I was there started to all of a sudden creep up and more employees were being hired for these types of services. And so in 2018, uh, KPMG advisory revenue surpassed audit for $11 billion. In 2021, PwC's advisory revenue surpassed audit. Deloitte, I believe, I, didn't, I couldn't find the information here because it wasn't publicly available, but I believe Deloitte surpassed advisory revenue way before that as well. So what are these big four firms seeing? And then how can smaller accounting firms either follow in their footsteps or even leapfrog them because of the technology and support and evolution? Before I jump to the next slide, I'd love to see if any of the panelists had any perspective or insights into this or saw this, whether it was working for one of these firms or, or even at the outset of building products such as Ibrahim when he was at Intuit. Yeah, I think the... Um... SOX is a really good example of trends that can help like present opportunities for accountants or, or anyone that's providing accounting services. Um, you know, my, I worked in the big four, just like you did Taylor, we were at the same firm KPMG, but I wasn't in audit. I was in advisory, my whole existence and job and everything at the big four was all dependent on, on SOX doing internal risks and compliance things, uh, implementing COSO or, um, or testing internal controls. Um, and so, um, yeah, I think it's, I think SOX is a really good example of, of an area where, um, you see this opportunity and an accountant's roles expanding beyond the normal kind of testing or, or, uh, you know, uh, bookkeeping it's, it's starting to broaden into these, these different things, um, where SOX trying to create the right internal, um, control culture, that can safeguard um, and have an impact on, on accounting, but in a very different way than historically thought about with, with accountants. Um, so, yeah. Ibrahim, I'm, I'm curious from your, your perspective, like did SOX impact um, the way that we built tools or have, have you ever actually thought about SOX when you were building uh, accountant tools at, at Intuit? Yeah. It's interesting because often some of these rules that are, or, or law changes that affect larger companies don't necessarily manifest in software that we build for smaller businesses or smaller accounting practices having to change. But what I've seen definitely is that it directionally informs, hey, there's more of a focus on compliance and robustness and reporting. And even though some of these rules may not apply to us, we should still sort of get our ducks in a row and directionally be doing a lot more of that. So even though some of those rules didn't necessarily apply to smaller businesses or smaller accounting shops, it still saw a shift towards that directionally. No, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I think you both highlighted again, we're even though the big four may be working on, or the larger accounting firms may be working on activities that smaller accounting firms are not, they're directionally impacting them, whether it's us, their uh, 
clients expect that level of service because when they were whether working another firm, they received that level of service. So there is a trickle down effect. I do. Yeah. I do feel like, you know, even wor- working with some smaller companies and being a, um, a CFO for a, a smaller SaaS company, the first company I worked with, I still had that same expectation. We didn't use one of the big four firms, but when I was working with a, a smaller firm, I, I was, I was searching for some of that insight and guidance on, I knew how to implement socks for, a really large, uh, finan- you know, public entity, but how do you start building some of that culture internally, um, early on? I feel like there has been a little bit of a separate expectation on, on the smaller accounting firms as well. That's been built in by what the larger accounting firms do. No, absolutely. Awesome. So switching over to the next slide, uh, pass it over to JG. Yeah. I, mean, I just kind of, I guess, carrying on to that with, um, with the expectations of a startup or sorry, of an accountant working with different types of companies, um, you've got uh, some changing, I think, expectations from, from the growing companies. They're looking for more than just the services. They're looking for more than, than de- deliverables, uh, whether it's closed books or uh, taxes. Um, they're really looking for a trusted advisor. Um, and we can see here in the data that, that um, accountants are, for a business owner, individuals generally, accountants carry a large weight in their opinions. Um, so, yeah. No, absolutely. I think, I think one of the interesting points of this slide is that accountants are more trusted than family and friends, right? And so you trust your family and friends on a lot of things, whether it's health perspectives or other areas. But when it comes to running your business, you're looking at the accountant who you've hired, who potentially is maybe only doing your books, right? Or potentially you're only interacting with once uh, a calendar year around either closing or once every quarter to close your books or to potentially uh, file your tax returns, right? And they're looking at the accountant as the trusted advisor over their family and friends, right? So some other statistics on here that their financial planner was is also on here, which it was roughly around 9%. So again, acting as a trusted advisor improves the retention as well as client satisfaction. Yeah. And some of the, some of the, some of where I've seen this like be applied. Um, so I previously worked for a FinTech company and, and where the demands are changing, um, the, the accountants are able to bring more tools. I mean, historically, I think they've been preparing reporting and things like that, but now, um, they're able to use new tools and apply that trusted advisor type relationship to, uh, larger kind of financial topics. And so I've seen accountants be, um, considered more like an outsourced CFO in the early stage, especially as a company can't hire a CFO or afford a CFO. Um, and this is something that, um, you know, having the right tools and, um, partners around you can help you kind of apply that, that, uh, that value. I think that value also translates into one deeper relationships, but also maybe longer retention. Cause if you feel like you're getting that help and you're getting the support you need, that's outside of just the deliverables, you want to continue to work with that person that you think has your back. That's beyond just the dollars that they're getting for the, the services or, or tax filing or whatever it might be. And so um, Mercury, I think is a good example of that. We've intentionally built some tools um, to focus on um, uh, making that, that uh, value add maybe broadly uh, applicable. Alex, I don't know if you want to talk and highlight some, some ways that we make finance easy for, for companies and, and maybe some of the things that accountants can uh, advise their, their companies on. Yeah, for sure. Um, maybe we can just go to the next slide. I, I think like accountants are generally high trust for, for business owners. Like that's certainly what I've seen at Mercury, but there's like, if you can provide these advisory services, so, you know, really anything like outside of bookkeeping, um, you really become even more trusted. And this is a benefit to both you uh, and your clients for retention, client satisfaction. Um, a stat we found from onpay.com, like when getting this presentation ready, was that uh, only 61% of business owners were satisfied with their accountant's level of service. 
Um, and for business owners who strongly agreed their accountant was a trusted advisor to them, that number actually increased up to, to 88%. And so the way I'll see accountants do this on, on, on Mercury is, is leveraging the platform to, um, you know, have more control than what you would traditionally be doing as just a, a bookkeeper. So um, the way they'll, 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 they'll leverage the platform is, um, you know, we have roles and permissions where a bookkeeper can, can be on a, a, an account and have um, certain permissions to uh, spin up um, virtual physical debit cards with monthly limits, um, leverage our integration with QuickBooks and Zero, and just be a little more um, actively involved in their clients' accounts from the time they refer them to the time they're onboarded, um, and, and, and really leverage the platform to, to do more than traditional um, bookkeeping. No, absolutely. And I think that also transitions to nicely into Neotax's service offering. And maybe Ibrahim, you could talk a little bit about that as well. Yeah, I think the the thinking here is that so much of this is really tedious and 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 to some degree monotonous. And one of the things that accountants categorically can add value to their clients, and a lot of that is the relationship. And we're we're hoping that we can really abstract away lots of the complexity and the more boring bits of of that so that folks accountants can really focus on um, the, the relationship and the, the strategic guidance and the advice. And so from our perspective, Neotax is a, and I'm just going to read out what you guys are all reading here, but fast, simple, and accurate tax solution. And we started with the R&D tax credit, which many accounting firms have told us takes hours and hours and hours, and we've been able to bring it down to minutes. Um, and it really just frees up a lot of time for accountants to talk more about the the strategic guidance that they can offer as opposed to having most of their billable hours filled up with just cranking through uh, more of the minutiae-ish kind of bits of of uh, of their work. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the the areas of tying Mercury and Neotax is the ability to provide accounts with more time in their day to do activities that are considered advisory or strategic in nature, right? Whether Neotax is saving time on performing an activity such as the R&D credit, as well as some other activities, Mercury, it's, it's a bit of providing the account and the ability to have financial insights into how the company is operating at the banking level, right? And before you used to have to run multiple reports, you'd have to run a report from here, a report from there, but Mercury is able to condense that and provide a financial overview and picture for the accountant that ultimately is saving them time and then additionally providing them insights into how they can start to provide service or provide other work for their clients. Uh, for Neotax, one of the things that the reason that we started with the R&D credit is changing the account or changing the client's perspective around what an accountant is or a, a, a bookkeeper or an outsourced CFO or, or an individual filing like their taxes. Originally, they, they look at an individual when you first hire someone as a compliance, right? Like you need to do these activities back uh, backwards looking, right? By providing clients with money up front, it starts all of a sudden transitioning or changing that mental shift of how people think about working with their accountant, right? They then see, oh, you just provided me with a bunch of value. You provided me with capital or more capital that I didn't even know if that was even out there, right? And I think, again, they can, our accounts can leverage that same type of transitional mind shift for their clients with Mercury, right? They can run reports, they can provide more insights. And all of a sudden, the individual who was originally their bookkeeper has now become that trusted advisor who they go to when they're looking to make financial decisions or making decisions for their business. Yeah, one of the things that was really important to us at Neotax is flipping tax from something that people typically think of with dread, right? Unfortunately, into something that really is advantageous for the business. And so how do you take something that's often sometimes a pain to deal with and turn it into a genuine strategic advantage for the company? And, and, and folks on the, on the call today know this, taxes are a strategic advantage for the business if you're able to do them correctly, if you're able to do them well. And so the R&D credit kind of represents this first example of how we're able to flip taxes into being, you know, to not to be too cheesy, but from a liability into an asset, from something that's just how do we minimize our downside when we think about tax to how do we maximize our upside when we think about things like the R&D credit. And, and like I said, the, the, the R&D credit is a perfect first example of this. 
um, I was used to build products at Intuit. And now as we're building this product, folks often say, oh, it's so cool that you have, you know, one of our co-founders at Neotax is a former IRS agent who used to audit R&D credits at the IRS for six, seven years. And folks say, oh, it's great that you have an IRS agent building the product with you. And we often joke that, yeah, try shipping a product with an IRS agent breathing down your neck. And so, yes, it's fast. Yes, it's simple. But at the end of the day, it is accurate and compliant. And we know that there are no corners that can be cut there. And so we make sure that compliance and accuracy are at the heart and soul of it. And then obviously, whatever we can do to make it fast and simple, we do as well. Awesome. All right. So continuing on the, uh, from uh, pain to power, uh, Alex, maybe I can uh, punt it over to you for a minute. Oh, yeah. I think I uh, already read the stat tied to this about just the number increasing on um, the trusted advisor, like when the business sees that extra uh, value, their, their satisfaction with their account jumps from, from 61 to 88%. Yeah, absolutely. And I think again, if if you're in the audience right now thinking, how do I how do I start helping or how do I start thinking of that transitional shift? Uh, there's two companies here that are more than happy to help you along that way. All right. So transitioning, starting to think more forward looking. All right. So now we're compliance to advisory. Got it. So what how how do we leverage the the stack or the potential financial stack that's out there, accounting stack, and what are other ways to think about this? Well, um, here's a fun set. In 2015, Accenture stated, transactional tasks will move to integrated business service solutions that use robotics, which will automate or eliminate up to 40% of transaction accounting work by 2020. I don't know if that's really occurred today. They haven't submitted a, a report to kind of see if their claim was valid. Uh, some say it is at 40%. Some say it's higher. Some say it's lower, right? It's to each their own, right? But what I would say is there is, there is a massive groundswell of building tools and support, uh, supporting accountants to, again, to Ibrahim's earlier point, to remove those maybe mundane tasks so you can free up your time to do more of the work that you enjoy doing, right? Whether it's providing advisory services to your clients or spending more time with your children, it's up to you. So here, here's a really uh, another interesting uh, change that also is occurring. So the AICPA has made changes to the 2021 exam that put more of an emphasis on understanding business processes, automation, and data analytics. So this is just another tidbit of uh, information that's coming down, again, trying to get in front or seeing this wave that's occurring and making sure the individuals who are now coming into the workforce are aware and ready and, and ultimately can then provide more services and value to their clients. So in this next couple of slides, we'll talk about the accounting tech evolution. Um, there's more or less three different phases that we've seen occur. Uh, that have also kind of followed the earlier slide that we talked about and kind of where we are today. So in accounting tech 1.0, human handle, or humans handled most of the accounting and taxes. Companies relied on outsourced experts in preparation and compliance was very manual. So when you think of this accounting tech evolution, you can think of the big four or other accounting firms where those And a lot of these firms are actually still relying on this. They're relying on Excel spreadsheets, manual reconciliations. Uh, they're also relying on the, the audit rules that were put in place uh, a number of years ago. Uh, and there's a lot of manual efforts that's going in. Uh, a fun anecdote, uh, when we talk about uh, when we're building products, one of the products we're actually comparing ourselves to is an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, Excel spreadsheets probably are the number one used product for most accounting services. And so this is the other thing you can think of an example company here is maybe Microsoft or an Excel, right? So that was the original accounting tech evolution 1.0. Oops. And, and the next bit was obviously not just software, but things moving into the cloud as well. 
Um, and this has really stretched the last few decades, right? Um, where basically our calculators got upgraded, our spreadsheets got upgraded, but nonetheless, largely humans doing lots and lots of work, but just using slightly better tools. And this was the, the, the shift that happened, sort of what we're calling right now 2.0, which leads right up to 3.0. Yep. And this is, you know, we kind of talked about this before, but, you know, tools like Neotax and Mercury, where we can help streamline things, take on even more of the manual tasks that, um, that accountants are doing uh, to, to make you to be able to focus on the client relationship even more. Um, and, uh, you know, there were, were some examples of that, but there's a bunch of ancillary tools out there and, and, and even more that are being built actively to make sure that we can streamline and make uh, the accountant's time focused on higher value, um, activities beyond a lot of the monotonous manual work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'd like to double click on kind of, sorry, accounting tech 3.0. Like there's a lot of these, you're starting to see more and more companies, uh, start to like, as an accountant, right? Like you're probably getting pitched more and more technology or technological platforms than you've ever had before. Right. So I think as you maybe uh, I, I open up to the panel, um, when you're thinking of selecting the financial tech stack for your firm and ultimately for your clients, like what are, how would you go about this? Like what, what are some questions that you have? What are some areas that when, for example, if Neotax reached out to you, like what are you trying to uncover to see if it actually can really provide value to you as well as to your firms? Um, since I, uh, maybe Alex, if, if you have a perspective on that or, or if you have an idea of when talking with accountants, like what are they looking for on building that financial tech stack? Yeah, for sure. I, I guess from my perspective, it's always sort of coming from like, what is this value? What is the value of, of leveraging like this tech forward, um, you know, online friendly banking uh, platform to my clients? And, and I guess that, that sort of, manifest in, in two categories. One is like, what are the actual capabilities? How, like, what's the, what are the differences? What is the value from a, uh, you know, I'm searching my transactions past 90 days. I'm sending in ACH and a wire. Like, can I do all the things that I need, um, or my clients need? And then the other is like, what is the, 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 the transparency piece? Like, what is the, um, cost associated, if it's like a free account, what are, um, you know, understanding the business of, of, of Mercury and like where we, we, we make our revenue, um, cause we do provide accounts for free debit cards for free, um, and, and make revenue on the actual interchange there. So there's sort of a twofold understanding of, of, you know, what is this new, um, growing technology? How is it different from legacy players? How does that translate to the value of my clients? And then after that, it's what does this mean for me as the accountant? What is the actual tools I can leverage to um, provide more value, whether it's from a uh, uh, being a linked user and having the ability to um, you know, access multiple accounts you're working on, or even more complex, we have an API, there's things you can do um, to automate and, and kind of create some interesting use cases. So that tends to be where I see the evaluation is, you know, what, what value to the customer, what's the transparency piece on the pricing, and then how can I leverage this to be more uh, higher value to, to my clients? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, I think one of the nice things and beautiful things about when accountants start working with Mercury is seeing the access that they get, right? It's all of a sudden they start using Mercury. They started maybe once a month or once a quarter, they were using Mercury to do reconciliations or to pull reports for their clients. And then all of a sudden Mercury launches a partnership or relationship with Neotax and they start using it more. Uh, maybe then it starts maybe once a week. Right. And, and I think one of the beautiful things, and, and when I talk with other accountants is there's two folds, right? One is look at the product today and see what value you can provide today and see, is it worthwhile to build a, that relationship? But also the second piece is look at where the company is going. Right. And I think one of the things that a lot of, uh, firms have done is they, they think about it like, hey, here's the product today. This is the problem it's going to solve today, right? And I think that's that's super important, right? Like, obviously, it needs to provide value on day one, right? 
But the next thing is looking about where the value can be tomorrow or the day after and the day after, right? And I think that you'll start to see more and more firms start not only providing today value, but more or less, what's the future value of this relationship, right? And I think that's, to me, one of the areas that I speak with a lot of the accountants. I always, when I, when I interact with them, I, I talk about neotax and the value we can provide today, but I also talk about what the future value is, right? And I think one of the other things for Mercury is, if you would have an accountant, you would have used Mercury, let's just say two years ago, the way you use Mercury today is exponentially different as well as better, right? And then if you multiply that another five or 10, et cetera, years, that's the, the trajectory of when evaluating software is evaluating relationships that you should take. That more forward-looking, like obviously value today, but also forward-looking value tomorrow. Um, Ibrahim, maybe you can talk a little bit about around forward-looking tax products, um, as well as uh, more or less maybe the account or the the Mercury relationship and ne like why is Neotax and Mercury talking today, right? And so maybe you can provide a little insights there too. Yeah, I think there's there's plenty of opportunity. We've got plenty of accountants that use our software today, and and as they go through the R and D credit, their mind you can sort of see their mind working as to well, if you can do this for the R and D credit, I I wonder what else you can do for all the other things that I that I do from a tax prep perspective, and. You know, when we first spoke to Mercury, it was not just about where's all the data that's important to use for tax prep or R&D credit purposes, but it's also where folks go to, to extract the kind of financial value for their business. And so Mercury is starting to become, if not already, the leader of uh, sort of the leading technology provider as a purveyor of all sorts of financial value for businesses and for accountants. And as folks continue to look to Mercury for that, it makes sense for Neotax to be in close partnership um, to deliver all sorts of tax value that comes from that data or other financial value via tax strategies. And so we're keeping a close pulse, for example, all the tax laws and tax codes as they change. Um, we're reading all the documentation so that you don't have to. And you can sort of trust that if there's anything that comes down the line um, that we've taken a, a really thorough look at it and we've extracted all of the value that can be applied for your business or your practice as a, as a firm and the, the value that you can extend to the rest of your clients. And that oftentimes that data exists within Mercury, oftentimes it's in other places, but the, the more we have a holistic view of all the different things that are going on financially in your business, whether you're using a capital product like venture debt or otherwise, how can we bring all these things together and create compounding effects where each of them are sort of like in a virtuous cycle with one another so that your tax strategy and your finance strategy and all that data is working for you to build the best strategy forward for your business and for your clients' businesses. Yeah, absolutely. I think that you've summarized extremely well around Accounting Tech 3.0 and ultimately where we're moving towards. So with that being said, we always love forward-looking pred our predictions. Um, so yeah, so we have three. Um, and then after these three, we'll go into Q&A. So we'll try to allocate around 15 minutes of Q&A. Um, and then from there, uh, yeah. Um, so Ibrahim, maybe you can take the first, uh, the first prediction for our prediction for accountants in 2022 and beyond. Yeah, I think this is no surprise. And I, um, if, especially if you live in certain parts of the U.S. right now, you look outside, I'm looking outside the window, there's at least one or two cars driving themselves. And, you know, we suspect that cars are driving themselves. Surely we can use computers to do some of the crunching of numbers for us. Um, and, and like we said earlier, there's so much strategy involved with how taxes are come to bear for these businesses um, that crunching the numbers just becomes some of the foundational work to enable accountants to be more strategic in their guidance and their advice. And so we, we see, and we see not just because passively we think it's happening, we, we're actively taking a role, uh, playing a part in making this the reality technology and AI specifically playing a really crucial role in making accountants far more empowered to deliver much more strategic insight to their businesses and empowering also the business owners. No, absolutely. Ibrahim, maybe just one quick thing. Can you just double click on AI and automation, right? I think when we talk with accountants, originally there's an adverse reaction to AI and automation. And even like that Accenture report, right? they're automating 40% of your, your task, right? Like, can you talk a little bit more around like AI shouldn't be seen as a 
or, or maybe it should be seen as, as a threat, right? So I'd love your perspective around, around that as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, yeah, I think from a threat perspective, that's probably uh, 30 or 40 years out. Maybe I, I can't really comment on what's going to happen that far away. Um, however, what I can say, I think actually the more important question isn't, is this a threat to my job? Because I think any accountant that's used any sort of auto categorization knows that it, it it's really bad. I think the actual better question is, can your job go from, um, I think we saw on Reddit, a bunch of accountants saying, automation, are you kidding me? 90% of my day is correcting shitty automation. And so can you actually make the automation really good so that accountants are doing, spending a lot more of their time on the strategic stuff and automation that actually works for accountants, not against accountants. And that's where we really see it, uh, really see it working. No, absolutely. I think yeah, it, it's very, again, as the AI, AICPA brought automation and data analytics into it, right? It's it's the conversion between the two, aka accounting tech 3.0. All right. So the next one, clients will expect accounts to adopt more modern tech. So in order to stay competitive, being tech savvy will now be a requirement. Clients want to partner with accountant who will be able to leverage software to provide value to their business. So one of the things that we're seeing and working with we work with direct customers as well as accountants is that the customers that accountants are working with are maybe startups or maybe have building innovative products, right? They're used to uh, receiving, I don't know, notifications that their tax return was updated on their phone, right? Like they're used to seeing automation in the products that they're building. They're using uh, forward-looking products internally to ultimately help build their product, right? And then all of a sudden they go to their accountant and their account is mailing them their tax return, right? Like their the accountant is maybe not using the more like transparent software that is providing more insights to them. So all of a sudden, a, a, a company will start to question, is this the right accountant for me, right? And so I think one of the things that we've seen is the more tech savvy, the more in tune with technology an account is, the more of a competitive advantage it is for the accountant. Um, and this is also an expectations that clients also that we're seeing are having, right? It used to be, oh, that was a nice to have. Now it's starting to become a requirement, right? And I think one of the things that also clients are, the reason clients expect accounts to adopt more modern tech because they want them to be on the bleeding edge of innovation and of change, right? They don't want, they don't want their accountant to be reacting to things that are happening. They want them to be, be proactive, right? Because if their accountant is proactive, when they ask them a question about, hey, what is a new, uh, oh, we're looking to open up an office in Omaha, or we're looking to open an office in Tampa, which one's the best one, right? And if an accounting is going to go look at this, do a, a manual reconciliation between the two and not leveraging technology to perform this analysis or reconciliate or this analysis, the accountant or the client may be like, hey, is this actually the right solution? And so again, I think one of the important things for accountants uh, is to start to ad adopt technology as a part of one of their core offerings and features. All right, and to the, to, uh, the last one, uh, JJ, you wanna take this? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think one of the natural tendencies that we have as more technology gets in, implemented in, in industries is we fear, you know, what does this mean for me or how does this change my job? Um, and again, you know, I think when when a lot of people work with their accountants or their service provider on on things like this, they want a relationship. They want somebody who they can trust, they can advise them, they can do more than just the day to day tactical um, items. And you know, as we've, we've talked about kind of throughout this uh, presentation, the the hope would be that um, you know as as accountants adopt more modern tech, it's really allowing them to focus on that relationship. It's allowing them to broaden the impact or the uh, the value that they're driving for the, the client. Um, technology is never going to take away that human element, um, especially when it's something so important as your finances or your bookkeeping or your taxes. You want to make sure that there's there's somebody really overlooking that. And you know there is a difference between filling out a tax reform or uh, tax form and, and, uh, and then getting the strategic advice on what you can do throughout the year to prepare to optimize for that. 
that um, that return. Um, and so that's where we you know the, the technology is going to continue to help support and elevate the accounting profession to spend its time on strategic outcomes like that versus um, again just the the, the manual deliverables. Um, yeah. No, absolutely. I think that's super important, right? At, at the end of the day, we, for example, our cell phone, right? We use our cell phone, but it doesn't, re it doesn't replace the relationship that we have with our spouse or our family or friends or, or our accountant, right? And so it's seeing how can technology amplify those relationships versus diminish. And I think that's the one thing that both at Neotax and in Mercury is that we're building products to amplify relationships, not diminish relationships. And, and I think that's also to one of my earlier questions around when evaluating software that you're using, right? Is the software trying to remove you or is it trying to amplify your relationship with your client or is it trying to uh, put a barrier between you and your client? Right. And I think that's a really important thing to think about when evaluating software or evaluating your potential future finance stack um, is what is the what is what is the end goal of this software? Right. Is it is it to replace me or is it to amplify these relationships and amplify the things that I want to provide to my client? Um, and super important. Um, and again, to highlight. Uh, individuals view their accountants more as a trust advisor than to their family and friends. Um, so how do you leverage technology to continue to maybe support that, right? Awesome. So with that being said, that's the end of the presentation. Uh, and now we'll, we'll jump to Q&A. Uh, I don't know if I, I don't have you into the, the Q&A screen or, or things, but uh, yeah. Feel free to ask your questions in the chat uh, or Q and A section, and we'll be able to bring them up. I can watch the the Q and A here in, in in Zoom if anyone wants to drop something there. But we do have some uh, questions from before the uh, the webinar, um, Taylor. The first one is how well this one's specifically on Mercury. So maybe this is uh, more for Alex. But um, how well does Mercury integrate with APIs and services? Yeah, I think, you know, we have the integrations that you would need today, be it like a QuickBooks, a Xero. Um, we're constantly adding integrations. If you go in the dashboard, we have like an integrations page, which is just shows everything we link to for um, all of our users. I guess the more interesting things uh, clients and, and partners can do is like leverage our, our API, which really allows... Um, automation of, of, of banking things, whether it's, you know, downloading transaction history, account queries, um, you know, pulling statements, getting interesting timing for, for documentation that can be relevant to, to bookkeeping. So um, I think for me, that's one of those things when I think about like, what is the value of having this, this um, tech forward company providing your banking services or in the context of a partnership, your, your clients banking is, um, you know, the probably most exciting version of that is leveraging uh, the APIs and, and automating some of these things in, in interesting ways. Um, so, you know, not, not necessary as far as finding value in, in Mercury. There, there are some quick wins um, just like straight out of the, the dashboard in the box, but um, we're always, uh, open to and interested in um, exciting integrations uh, via API. Absolutely. And I think just one thing to highlight too is similar to Neotax, uh, a lot of the API requests or integrations are coming from our user base, right? And, and I'm assuming that's also how Mercury operates and uses too. So feedback from the user base ultimately helps drive and prioritize those types of APIs and integrations. There's, there's a, um, two questions that are kind of somewhat similarly related. Um, and I think we, you know, we've kind of touched on a lot of this, but how to scale revenue, um, in accounting and tax businesses, how do you scale their revenue and then how to lower the tax operations for, for a practice? Yeah. Ibrahim, you want to maybe take that? Sorry. Can you repeat it? I'm just not sure. I, 
Yeah. So like, how do you optimize or how do you scale revenue for an accounting or tax business? And how do you lower the tax operations in that tax business? Yeah, it really depends on. So I, I think, and this is something that we have quite a few perspectives on, although we, we typically try to shy away from telling accountants how to run their practice, but we, we do work with lots of accountants and we are seeing best practices versus not so much best practices. Um, and we're seeing that definitely folks that are still billing hourly, um, moving away from that is like one of the ways that you can definitely uh, utilize software to make things like Neotax or, or other software that exist to make things take far less time, but also without necessarily coming at, an, at, at, the, at a cost to your firm and your firm's um, top line. Um, it also improves your margin. We found that for many of the firms that we work with, the R&D credit practice is likely the highest margin part of their business. And the more that they're able to scale that. And so it puts us in a weird position. We're like, Hey, we know that you want to focus on tax and we're building a lot of software to help you there. But like, if you really push this R and D credit thing forward, you can make a lot more revenue. So top line grows pretty dramatically and your margin profile of your business starts to get much, much better. And it's a way that specifically with software, you can support either lots of clients or fewer clients with fewer overhead and headcount. One of the other things that we found some of the, and Taylor can maybe confirm this, some of the accountants that have been most successful with the R&D credit actually use it as a way to acquire new customers. And so they say, hey, I'm gonna make this up. Maybe you don't do this, but I'm like, hey, we'll do your tax return for free on the first year. Come, we'll do your R&D credit. Did you know that you can get all this money back? And all of a sudden you've changed the, the paradigm of the conversation entirely from let us do this again with all due respect, boring tax compliance stuff for you. And it's now changed the conversation into, we can get you a whole lot of money. We are tax experts that can use tax as a strategy for expanding your business, growing your business, actually giving you money. Um, we take a small percentage of it and then we'll do your, you know, and sort of, it changes the, I think the nature of the relationship where now my accountant is someone who's bringing me lots of money as a, as a client um, and you're leading with that value upfront. So those are some of the ways, again, they're obviously very centered and oriented around using the R&D credit because that's where we operate. And it obviously is also centered around using Neotax to help your firm do that. But you, you can see how that is extensible to other parts of your practice as well. Yeah, I, I'd maybe double click in that it's there's some. Uh, so, what they're calling is uh, what Ibrahim was highlighting is like value based uh, revenue, right? Like, or value based pricing. Uh, you've see, you've started to see this in healthcare, right? Like, so for example, healthcare, you were being charged like these flat fees or these hourly type rates, like in an accounting firm. But then all of a sudden, you would go to the doctor and be like, hey, why, why am I paying this? Like, I'm not feeling any better. I don't feel that there's value-based care out there. Right. And so all of a sudden now the medical practices in a lot of companies are starting to flip that up on its head. That's starting to come into the accounting world and service as well. Right. So more, more clients are, are asking is like, Hey, look at like, it's a race to the bottom, for example, for a tax return. Right. So they'll, if, if all their books are already in order, right. Like they are looking for the cheapest individual to just file their tax return in the, in the right and compliant way. And so that's a race to the broad, bottom because there's more in their eye, it's not as much value, right? So it's then accountants are now trying to transition shift is trying to find what are those now value, value additive areas that we can provide to our clients. Uh, the R&D credit is, is a great example of that, um, providing money back into your client's pocket. But there's a bunch of other ways of doing that the other way I would also say is, is how you drive more revenue to your business. It's, it's pretty simple. Add more clients, right? But if you're adding more clients and the amount of time it takes you to do an activity is still the same, then you need to hire more people. So, so ultimately, at the end of the day, it's how do you become more efficient with your time, right? And I think that's where Neotax and Mercury are playing, right? Our perspective is we're building products for you to add more volume, but not increase the amount of time, right? And so that's a phenomenal way of thinking of how do I leverage software technology to increase the volume of clients that I have, but also it decrease the amount of time, right? One of the things that I'm personally really passionate about is, is time, right? Like time is the only thing that no matter how much money you have, you can never buy it back right? 
So at the end of the day, it's, it's really around harnessing and valuing your time and then valuing your time and also the eyes of your client. Is it value-based or not? Jason, were there any other ones or maybe I can pop one more question and... Uh, the other, the last one was, um, and it's maybe related to actually that topic was, um, yeah, I have multiple locations or multiple clients that are using Mercury. How do I like have this be efficient and all streamlined in one area? Um, I want to say they, they gave an example. Hold on one second. Let me pull it up that what it said. Um, for example, by midsummer, we will likely need 20 plus accounts and grow year after year. So Alex, I don't know if you want to talk about just mul how many accounts somebody can have and then the toggle between different clients to change companies. Yeah, and I think that is a good example of like one of those quick features that Mercury can help with. Like you just have the ability uh, to link all your clients' accounts to um, your account and easily toggle between them. Um, you know, this makes things easier just from like a, oh, I'm in my dashboard, I can switch between accounts things, but it also like gives you more power as far as you can create, you know, numerous checking accounts instantly. You can set up auto transfer rules to create things like zero balance accounts, um, leverage those user permissions we talked about. So yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's the, the theme of, um, sort of efficiency and, you know, I really like the concept of, you know, doing something that's going to augment your efficiency and not block you but then there's this like a bit of a played out word but like how can this help me simplify and i think sometimes when you're changing um you know something be it like a banking service or a tax services to something very new there can be this like intimidation of like is this going to make things so much more complicated that whatever the end state value is is uh not going to be worth it for me to get there and i think there is this um you know, there are certain things, be it with a Mercury or, you know, Neotax or, or, or these similar things where it's like there, there, there's a, an ability to or, or there's at least a risk of like looking at the new and thinking this is going to cause more trouble than it's worth. When in reality, there are likely some some very quick, high value things you can start leveraging. And as you gain more comfortability with the platform, the product flow, then I think you can start scaling and really start seeing those efficiency improvements like at scale. Um, and I think like linking accounts is a good example of a quick win feature on, on, on Mercury. Absolutely. Well, with the essence of providing individuals with time, uh, I think we'll end a five minutes early and give you guys time back. Um, one, I, I, I appreciate everyone's ability, or I appreciate everyone's time uh, in taking and getting to learn more uh, about our perspective around where the accounting industry is going and ultimately providing a, a, a resource to you to, to build that future uh, for you and your, your firm. So uh, again, as always, uh, it was a pleasure. Um, again, you have our contact information that was shared in the chat. Uh, feel free to reach out anytime uh, and thank you for your time.